I guess I, I never really thought I would stick with skin, but there's so many fascinating questions. Um, how do you, how can the outer surface of our skin and our hair uh, be generated from the same cells? I, I just find that remarkable. What a structural feat um, to create two tissues with completely different organization, completely different features, uh, and it all comes from one single layered epithelium on the, on the body surface of the embryo. Uh, so I find that fascinating. It took us a good 20 years before we ever got to the point where we knew enough of the groundwork to be able to go after the native niches for stem cells that exist within the skin. Um, we've known for years you could culture the cells, but we didn't know where where the stem cells really reside within the skin. And so, uh, so we've, we've tackled that problem. We're still tackling it. There are m multiple different compartments of stem cells that exist within the skin. Um, but it starts to give us some insights into why adult stem cells go through these transitions between um, dormancy where they're not used and active states where they're used to make tissues. When do they do that? What do they respond to? How does the normal hair follicle undergo these cyclical bouts of growth and degeneration? Um, how does a wound heal itself? Uh, both require stem cells. Um, both are very different processes. When I first started the, with the system, I really went into human epidermal cells as a model system for studying uh, for studying growth and differentiation in what we now call stem cells. Um, and only at the time that we were studying, it was right at the cusp of DNA recombinant technology, and there was really very little known about the major structural proteins of the of these skin cells. Uh, people studying uh, erythrocytes and hematopoietic uh, system were far accelerated over where we were at the f in the field. The immun immunology field was way ahead of us, um, and it was very clear that uh, that globins were the major structural proteins of the blood cells. What wasn't so clear is beyond the fact that keratins were the major structural proteins of the of the skin cells. Was how many keratins are they all? proteolytic degradation products of, them, of each other. There uh, seem to be a lot of bands on a gel. Is, are they encoded by multiple genes, by one gene? Um, what do they do? Human geneticists were basically choosing their disease. Um, sickle cell anemia, uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, um, uh, cystic fibrosis, um, breast cancer using position, a, a technique known as positional cloning, which is basically taking all the chromosomes and mapping out where, where is a defect in a large family that, that has affected and unaffected members, where does the defect map, and then slogging your way through the genome, uh, doing gene sequencing to identify the mutation responsible for the disease. We really were saying, could we do the exact opposite? We started with the protein tried to understand as much about the protein and its function as we could, and then let the mice guide us to the genetic basis of a disease that was completely of unknown etiology. We didn't even know what that disease was. It affects only 1 in 40,000 in the population, but, um, but uh, taking an entirely reverse approach. And it was really, I think, the, the first example where uh, where you could use mice to basically guide you to the human genetic basis of disease. Mouse genetics are now widely used and applied to human genetics, but at the time it was uh, unconventional. Um, and, uh, and so I'd say that was probably really the uh, the aspect that set it set the work apart that caused people to notice when otherwise I think very few people quite frankly were interested in keratin very few people at the time were interested in skin 
um, and uh, and yet they they took notice of the strategies that we're using. I definitely called my mom, so who's now close to 88 and uh, fortunately still uh, trucking uh, uh, strong enough to be able to make it to the White House and be there for the ceremony. What uh, did she say? <laughs> uh, well, I said, would you like to make a trip to the White House? And uh, this was kind of interesting because she basically had indicated to me that she didn't think she was ever going to travel again, that at her age it was just too much of a hassle and all. And of course, that was to come to New York City and this was to come to the White House. She immediately said, Absolutely. I'm not going to miss this for anything. My mother, who was a housewife, um, made me a butterfly net when I was a young child and uh, made it out of a, an old broom and a coat hanger and some netting and, uh, and that got me started. Um, Send me out to the cornfields during the day and, and, uh, and I, I was satisfied for the whole day. Um, the next thing she did was start to give me uh, uh, cooking utensils such as strainers and bowls that she didn't need anymore and I set up the backyard and, and the porch, a screen porch in the backyard with going down to the swamps and bringing back pollywogs and crayfish and looking at metamorphosis and maybe doing my first experiments that were complete bust. My lab really still sets itself apart maybe from the other classical stem cell labs in that my lab still has this active interest in the cytoskeleton. We still have an interest in architecture of cells, something we've been interested in for many, many years. And, and I think it's still a fascinating aspect of how do stem cells build tissues, whether in a wound repair process or in their normal homeostasis. And, uh, and so That'll keep us busy for quite some time to come, and hopefully we'll continue as we have over the years um, uh, touching upon human applications, whether it's working out the genetic basis of different types of skin cancers or of genetic uh, disorders, or whether it's, it's solving uh, the problem of, uh, of baldness, which I'd be happy to do as a icing on the cake.